what's going on, everybody? How's it hanging? How's it happening? Because you guys know this is Kevin from the Card Progression Podcast. Hey, everybody. We are getting towards the end of the year once again. We're already at our last episode of November. Oh, whoa. Last episode of November. Can you believe it already? Yeah, I can. And this one is one that I honestly can't believe we actually got to do. Like, this one actually blew my mind. The fact that I got to talk to someone like this about a subject like this. So, before we jump in, I want to thank our sponsor for the podcast. It's Manscaped. Yep, Manscaped, the best care for your boys down there. So, now that we're past Thanksgiving, everyone's like, oh, it's the holiday season. But I'm more in like the dragged under kind of sound, like this holiday. I want to be alone. I need fun on mistletoe on my own. Yeah, I kind of want to step forward to a Christmas tree. My Christmas tree. Not anybody else's. I'll just do it to my own. But basically what I'm saying is the holidays are coming up. And one of the best ways to show that person in your life that you care about them is showing that you care for their boys down there. So that's where Manscaped comes in with many different products to help the person in your life care for their stuff down there. And if you're going to get someone anything around there, I mean, you can get the lawnmower 4.0 you can get the weed whacker trimmer i suggest specifically the crop preserver anti-chafing ball deodorant so for myself i mean i I run a lot like i'm always running always biking always doing some kind of crazy cardio always going into mosh pits and like going to festivals as well oh my god it's just I, i could chafe pretty badly let me tell you that i've done that before and then all of a sudden i started using the crop preserver anti chafing ball deodorant and Chafing became a thing of the past for this guy. Oh, yeah. No more chafing in between the legs down there using that stuff. It smells good. And on top of that, you don't want to deal with chafing down there. So that's what the anti-chafing ball deodorant crop preserver is all about. Oh, yeah. So get yourself some. Get some for the person in your life. And also check them out because Manscaped has a lot of other things. They got a lot of performance packages as well that might be perfect for someone in your life this holiday season. So you can go to Manscaped.com. Use the code CPP to get 20% of free shipping on your entire order. Show somebody you care this holiday season about their boys down there. Manscaped.com. Now to our feature presentation. My God. Thorpe Records and Sailor Grave Records founder Andrew Thorpe King is on the podcast today. He has a brand new book called Failure Rules, The Five Rules of Failure for Entrepreneurs, Creatives, and Authentics. And we dive deep in this. We dive deep into rule number two where nothing is safe. We dive deep into rule number four, which is find your thing one and thing two dependency. Yeah, we go deep into that one specifically. Why this one has much more of a tangible aspect to it instead of more of this like professional development theory. Like, no, this actually is much more tangible to actually get a hold on to. On top of that, one of my favorite things is we talk about bringing the mosh pit mentality to your creative journey, to your calling journey. And... If you've ever wanted to start something for yourself in life, if you don't want to follow through that nine to five grind, if you want to be creative, if you want to have that entrepreneurial spirit, if you really feel it inside of you, this book and this conversation will definitely lead you to that path. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah, we're ready. Let's go! Yeah. Well, 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 ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, listeners of the Chord Progression Podcast. Typically, when we bring artists or anyone in the music industry on here, we usually talk about, you know, what music is coming out, what they have been doing. This one, similar, but a little bit different, because we get to talk all about a brand new book called Failure Rules, The Five Rules of Failure for Entrepreneurs, Creatives, and Authentics. And the author, who is here with us today, founder of Thorpe Records, founder of Sailor's Grave Records, my God, if there's any person to talk to about entrepreneurship, creatives, authentics, rules of failure for success, this is the guy. So please welcome Andrew Thorpe King to the podcast. So Andrew, welcome to the Core Progression Podcast. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me on. Good Thanks to talk for, to you, Kevin. It's great to talk to you. How has everything been going in your world as of late, especially with the book? How has everything been? Uh, it's great, man. It's just a lot of, of frenetic activity. Uh, you know, the production uh, marathon of the book is kind of over. Now it's beginning the discovery process and the marathon for marketing, building a brand, building an audience, which, you know, is different than doing that for on behalf of bands for my record labels for years. That piping was in place. We had, you know, lots of uh, different ways of handling things. We had our kind of own trade secrets. In the book world, there's a lot of adjacency, but it's also very different. So, uh, you know, I'm not leveraging as much third party help. I mean, I have some help with uh, publicist and, you know, one kind of coach slash consultant who's a a best selling author. And I have, um, uh, you know, also working with uh, music publicists specifically for the music space, as you know. 
Um, but uh, I'm really enjoying all the activity and the discovery and seeing the response and the feedback from readers and, and from viewers from my YouTube channel and, and all that. So it's, uh, it's been a blast. That is fantastic to hear. And that was one thing I was thinking about as well when it comes to marketing this book, getting it out there, getting it so that people get their eyes and ears on it and just get their minds into it as well. When it comes to releasing music, you have just the perfect setup for that because you've been doing it for so long. And when it comes to this, it's similar in the same way, but it's different because it's a different type of medium, different type of publication, different type of concept that's got to be around there. So the adjacencies are pretty close, but there's yes. always going to be those different subtle nuances that you, especially when it comes to a massive book like this, you want to make sure it gets out and gets out right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, I mean, you know, the cool part is, is it's multi-format, right? It's everything from ebook to the paperback to the hardcover. And then the audio book, which I'm discovering is, is really the preferential way to consume books like this in this space and kind of the business psychology. I hate to use the word, but I guess self-helpy, uh, you know, personal development space. Uh, and I'm finding that getting a lot of audio book sales, a lot of good feedback on that, which is great. I had this guy, J.S. Seng, do the audio book. He's got a tremendous cadence and urgency in his voice. He's, uh, you know, not not a stranger to, uh, you know, the, the music world or the film world. He was an actor on the show Twin Peaks on Showtime. He helped direct the social distortion video Machine Gun Blue. So he, he kind of in touch with the, the punk zeitgeist, you know, so I had a very specific kind of ask for the type of voice I wanted. And so that's been really cool to see the response on that. I, I did a book in the past. I'm also a spy novelist. And I never did an audio book before. So that was neat. So I'm finding that to be kind of like the lead format. So I'm going with it and pushing that harder through social media and everything else. Um, but in terms of just like releasing the book, I did have a great kind of structure and framework in front of me uh, working with Scribe Media, Lioncrest Publishing, who did books by David Goggins, who you probably know, ex-Navy SEAL. Uh, they did his book. They did James Altucher, who's a... Uh, Got an amazing uh, podcast, uh, the James Altiver Show, What the Book, Choose Yourself, which is a huge bestseller. So they've, did, they've done really big books. They've also done uh, Nassim Tlaib, who wrote Anti-Fragile. Um, so they have the experience. They have a cadre of ex-professionals uh, from the publishing world that, that all work there. And just the, the, the touch points along the way, the extra TLC for the editing and for developing the aesthetic and the branding. I mean, the woman who did the cover art did Stephen King's cover art. You know, for his books and so there there's a lot of professional help along the way and then they also do the, the marketing and and uh, and everything so you know I, I got a lot of the the kind of scaffolding around me to help me but yet there's still tons of discovery and variation and unknowns within that but i have a multi-year plan on how i'm going to try to evangelize this message with various formats so it's not just a book it's taking a message you know, doing YouTube videos. I've put a lot of work in YouTube videos. I've got a number of produced videos on my on my website or my YouTube channel at Andrew Thorpe King, no E on the end of Thorpe. I created a merchandise company that uh, echoes the ethos and themes of the book. So we're in a shirt right now, Soul and Fire Supply Company. Got a bunch of kick-ass designs from that. I, I leveraged a few um, awesome designers really from the music world. Pete McFay, uh, Pete McPhee, who did all the artwork for Dropkick Murphy's uh, album art, Social Distortion, Hank Williams III. And then also Craig Holloway did a number of designs for a specific smokeware line from the cigar world. And he's done um, you know, artwork for Agnostic Front, Wisdom in Chains, Nuclear Assault, a bunch of bands. So it's like I'm, I'm weaving in these worlds, right, of like entrepreneurialism, business psychology and uh, inspiration with like the, the cigar culture, with mm -hmm. punk and metal and hardcore culture. So it's like I'm, I'm really kind of like merging all these worlds and it seems to be working. It seems to find a lot of overlap in people who are interested in all three. And I think there's a lot of practical yet deep, like uh, instructive kind of stories within the book that people are really getting a lot out of, whether it's my own personal anecdotes or the, the, the huge variety of case studies that I layered in that all pegged to the five rules of failure. Oh, absolutely. When you brought up like other artists that had been worked with as well, once you brought up David Goggins, my mind just went like, oh yeah, of course I know David Goggins. Through something yeah. like that, I mean, uh, his book from 2019 can't hurt me. It's back there somewhere. I'll put it that way. It's back there somewhere. I know he just came out with a new one recently towards the end of 2022. Still have yet to check that one out though, because I do like David Goggins, especially with his whole entire mindset around everything. But one thing you said really stuck out to me when it came to the audiobook side of things, especially when it came to getting it into the ears and the minds of people and getting people to actually consume the content in the best way possible, especially with this being, it's not, I wouldn't say self-help because self-help is more just right. like, oh, 
let's just make you happy kind of thing. No, this is definitely it's professional. It's not whimsical, wishful thinking, and it's hard realities. Is what yeah, I mean. this is definitely professional development right here. And when even myself, when I was going through and trying to start the podcast, well, trying to get the idea for it, when it came to finding those prof- uh, professional development, just that content there, it was always like the podcast space or anything that had that audio driven stuff because yeah, I was working eight, eight and a half hours a day at a full-time job and yeah, I stuck in the office because this was pre-pandemic yep. and at certain times, you know, I didn't want to listen to music every single time. So pop in a podcast for like two, three hours and just listen to it and just consume that content over and over and over again. It's kind of like passive learning, but when you hear it so much over and over and over again, it really sinks into your brain and you really start to pick up on those concepts and you start to see those concepts, especially from the five rules of failure that you have here in other professional development content. You start to be able to figure it out. You connect the pieces in your head and then you go after what you want to go after. No, I think you're right. It's all about the applicability. I mean, I think that's the age we live in where it's like multi-format input it has to be the norm. You know, authors can't just think about, I wrote a book. I'm going to sit in a cab and write a book, hand it in my publisher and go write the next one. Like, you're not just a writer if you're a writer anymore. You can't be. You have to be a personality. You have to be an ambassador and a representative of the message in multi formats, or nobody will read your book. Nobody will hear the message. And you have to learn to accept that some people want to consume it in different ways. They might not want to read your book, but they might like your message. They might love your YouTube channel. They might like your merch. They might li- love hearing you on podcasts. And that might spark interest for them to download the audio book. You have to really think broadly. I and mean, I think musicians are the same way, you know, working with bands, my record label, like you're not really going to make money necessarily in, in most cases from the actual selling of your music. I mean, sometimes, but it's the merchandise. It's, uh, you know, it's publishing. It's, it's, uh, you know, making money on tour. Um, you know, it, it's all of that. So it's like, you really have to think of like a universe of, of uh, you know, monetary mechanisms uh, for your idea. Oh, absolutely. Especially for musicians as well. And coming from an author's perspective, from your perspective now, taking a look at all the different things that have to be touched on with different with social media, connecting with people, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, podcasting, audio. You have to connect on so many different aspects in order to get people's attention because you're competing for so many different things with other people. You're competing for that like on Facebook. You're competing for that moment on TikTok where all of a sudden, okay, people are going to look at that video. They're going to stick on it for a couple of seconds more and they're going to hit with that. And you have to have that personality behind it because if it's just the product, if it's just the music, if it's just the book, there is really nothing else there to attract people. You need to hit it on so many other avenues. And the like from the music side, the bands that are doing that right now are the ones that are growing and the ones that are absolutely right. getting more and more massive as time goes on. Right. And it's about creating and injecting yourself into a community. I mean, I think of Jamie Josta from Hatebreed. I mean, he was always he, he always had a portfolio of pursuits around his music, around the, the, the message, right? So he wasn't just a singer for Hey Breed, also started Stillborn Records, also was a host for Headbangers Ball, also does the Johnson Show podcast, also had his own clothing company, right? Like he also, I think he just bought Milwaukee uh, Metal Fest or something from, uh, from what I heard. Like, That's right. I totally forgot about that. He's always, he's thinking in a broad way. And it's like, I think the notion of, uh, trying to marry your money with your meaning in music is very necessary because a lot of artists just want to have this purified artist approach. And that is understandable, right? Because uh, creation is its own reward first before it can be anything else. But you still have to go towards the anything else because you want to mobilize your art. You want to bring it to the world in as many ways as possible. So you have to understand the economics and, and the flexing that is necessary to uh, broaden your message in various ways, right? And build and build uh, more around it to sustain it and to engage people, to build that network. Yeah, and if you don't do something like that, it's you, may, you might release like maybe the best song that you've ever released, but if you don't have all of that in the back end as well, pushing it, uh, your message out there, pushing your song out there, pushing whatever product you have out there, it's just going to end up falling on deaf ears with how many more, yep. just, how much more music, how much much more content we have out there to compete with. Yeah, you can get the one thing that absolutely pops up and gets it to start, but if you don't continue on with that, then it's you're just going to end up falling back into the into the crowd. You're just going to be background noise at that point. Yeah, I mean, another example I think of, you know, I'm also a spy novelist, so <laughs> I've been in that world too, and we're a spy novel and a few others that are developing, right? And I think of. Uh, one of my favorite spy novels, he's passed away now, is, is Vince Flynn. Uh, another, you know, modern example would be Brad Thor. And think of Brad Thor, he's a best-selling author, does publicity, does that kind of stuff, but he hasn't really built like a universe around his books, right? Uh, or, or the aesthetic or product, productized it uh, in a wide way. 
Um, and then I compare him to Jack Carr, who, act, who actually was a protege of his and got a lot of advice early on from Brad Thor. Jack Carr took a different approach, started his Danger Close podcast, has all these great guests on it. It's become really huge. He's, uh, you know, going on the Joe Rogan show and he's friends with Joe Rogan and, and, and Jocko. And he built a universe. He has his own merchandise, his own iconography, his own symbolism around it and uh, heavy on social media. And I don't think it's any surprise that you have these two authors, one established, one emerging and embrace a different model. And he's the one who got the Amazon show for Terminal List with, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, I can't remember the actor. Everybody knows him, but <laughs> the guy from, uh, from Jurassic Park. What's his name? Chris Pratt. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's, he, he's in that show, right? But I just think of those two models. I'm like, this is the one that works. You have to embrace the tentacles mm -hmm. and you have to build that, 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 that holistic kind of universe around your idea. Yeah, and, and the way that the, I can't, I'm just going to, I don't want to butcher it, the way that the original artist went about it, not really creating that universe, that might have worked, especially at a, at an earlier point in time where, you know, right. social media, everything around the air, that that wasn't as big of a concept. But when it comes to creating that universe around there, it's adapting to culture, adapting to yep. where the attention is. It's just all about adapting to what time where, where what time you have where it is and not being complacent with potentially what have gotten you there but what's yep. going to get you to the next step and for any that's entrepreneur right. that's out there when you start out it's you know you're fired up and you're on the forefront of what is new now but a big problem that comes in is you don't want to end up resting on your laurels because what got you success in 2008 is not going to potentially bring you success in 2022 based on shifting culture shifting ideals shifting technology shifting visuals there's there's so much change going on and you have to move with that. And if you don't move with that, you're going to end up getting left behind. That's right. Right. So, so the one, the one uh, author I mentioned, Brad Thor, he <laughs> enjoyed the advantage of building his career when the gatekeepers reigned, but then disintermediation hit and the floodgates were open. The barriers to excess were, were, were shattered, but then also the competition rose. So it's more of a street fight to get attention as opposed to being the lucky one who gets the publishing deal, the lucky one who gets the record deal, right? Now the lucky one is everyone because they all have access to the distribution. They all have access to their own media platform. Now it's just a street fight with more players. So it's a lot, it's a lot difficult in some ways uh, than, you know, than, than being the one who's the, you know, getting the camel through the eye of the needle to get that publishing deal or, the, or, or that record deal, right? Um, but it's still difficult and you have to embrace the width of that. Um, you know, and, and, you know, you talk about um, iteration, right? So I, ha I have a chapter in the book where I talk about uh, the need to create flow states and create the conditions that allow for flow states. And you still need to make a plan uh, like, you know, Peter Thiel, you know, who wrote zero mm -hmm. to one PayPal mafia guy talks about, you, you know, you still need to make a plan, even if it's a bad plan, you got to make a plan. Uh, and then, you know, you got Mike Tyson who says, all plans are great until you get punched in the mouth. So in my mind, both Teal and Tyson are right. Make plans, but have an intent to iterate when you get punched in the mouth when failure strikes. So, you know, expect failure. Think about how you're going to confront it when it's unavoidable, how you're going to metabolize it, how you're going to rise like the phoenix from the flames and let it purify you into something new and something stronger. Let old thinking die, new thinking emerge, and you iterate and you keep going your plan. You know, it's really about uh, pivoting, right? The pivot is... It's not a change in uh, vision. It's just a change in strategy to achieve mm -hmm. that vision, right? And so it's like you have to go with that mindset, like plan, map it out, write it fucking down, have multiple layers. If this, then that. If not this, then what? And you got to put it all down, but still know once you get going, you're on the highway. You don't know what you're going to run into. You don't know what kind of fucking road kill is going to be in your way. You still have to iterate along the way. Yeah, you never know exactly what problems are going to end up coming up. And if anyone has, you know, realized that it's everybody in the world when March of 2020 hit and our world just got completely turned upside down, the, our business, whatever it was, got turned upside down. But it wasn't about, oh, woe is me. Instead of focusing on what could have been and trying to make sure that, oh, if this all worked out, then this plan would have worked. No, when something like that happens, when you get to those points, you have to be able to pivot. You have to be able to figure out exactly, right. okay, this is the situation at hand. It's not going to change. How am I going to face? How am I going to do what I need to do and be the success I want to be given this situation? How can I take this and make this to my advantage? And like with myself for the podcast during the pandemic, it was, oh, darn, there's not bands touring. But what else are they doing? How else are they getting their message out? Come here, man. <laughs> how many guys in bands or, or, or women in bands started their own podcast because of the pandemic? Because they needed to keep 
keep keep themselves in, in the media, right? Podcasts, li uh, live streaming on Twitch, or just literally anything they could think of. So many of them had done that, and yeah, think, some of them I are still doing it to this day. From uh, Madball started his Smoking Word podcast during the pandemic. So, I mean, that's an example right there. Yeah, yeah. Per perfect example, but it's all about taking that, it's all about making sure that, you know, you still have that full-on drive, that full-on end goal that you want to achieve to find that happiness in your life, to find that success in your life in mind. And again, build those plans to get there. But when something happens, when you get punched in the mouth, what are you going to do about that? Because even as right. good old Rocky said, it's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can <laughs> get hit and keep going, how much you can take and keep moving forward. You're talking to a Philadelphia guy, so you speak my language and bring <laughs> up uh, Balboa there. For sure. So, no, yeah, I mean, you talk about the pandemic and pivoting because of the pandemic. I have an example in the book of um, a strip club in, in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I forget the name. I think it was like Lucky Devil's Lounge or something. And I talk about how pandemic hit, you know, uh, you know, the dancers didn't have any money. You know, things weren't working out. The guy pivoted and he, and he bastardized the Uber Eats moniker and turned it into Boober Eats and did <laughs> stripper delivery. You know, you know, boobs and pub food right to the door, you know, had, had, had the bodyguards or the bouncers or whatever with them, you know, and they brought their hand sanitizer, wore a mask, took off their shirts, and they still were able to make some living. I mean, mitigate some of the losses of the pandemic. I mean, you know, so it's like that's one example right there I use in the book. Pandemic hits. How are you going to find that adjacent possible? Mm -hmm. And even if you're not going, going in the same way you were before, at least mitigate, at least, you know, swerve into something to help keep you with a micro momentum. Yeah, and one of the play, another example I have is one of my fa my favorite venue here in Milwaukee, which is the Rave. During the pandemic, you know they're an independent venue, so how are they going to make money with no shows coming in? And right, especially at the beginning, no shows for the foreseeable future to come in. What are you going to do with that aspect? They've been around for thirty plus years. They had so much insane merch, so many insane just. Uh, concert posters that had been signed by bands. So they're like, you know what? Let's get these to the people. Let's put them up for auction. Let's see what happens. And then during Halloween, because the venue is supposedly haunted, which I can actually assure you it is because I've seen some stuff in there that's <laughs> like, eh. but during Halloween in 2020, they sold tickets to that would let you go in in very small groups and you could go and explore it. And all you got was all the lights were off. All you got was a flashlight and you could just go explore the whole entire place and just pivoting to make sure that they found a way to make sure they could keep That's the right. doors open and keep going so that when live music came back, that they were still in the prime position to do it. I mean, that's just, you know, you get punched in the mouth and how do you get back up? How do you pivot from that? And there's always going to be a way. You just got to find it. And think about examples like that. H how many businesses uh, had to do that because of the pandemic and how many of those ideas flourished enough where they even stuck post pandemic to be additive to their business model and create an extra layer of revenue that they otherwise wouldn't have felt uh, you know, pressure to provoke, to create. So it's that creative destruction of disruption, uh, which can be a good thing if you react to it correctly and with creativity. I mean, and, and that's part of the whole theme of failure rules is, you know, when, when you're purified by failure, if you treat it correctly and you leverage chaos as an idea engine, you don't just, uh, you don't just become resilient. You don't just get up and then you're at the same level you were before you were knocked down. You get up with an exponential strength, like the hydra that is that, that gains from harm, which is a concept from anti-fragile from the scene to lead. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about that anti-fragility of just gaining from harm and just growing in strength as you rise from, from, from the failures and from being knocked down. Yeah, and that kind of can speak to the first two rules you have from the your five rules of failure, one being that failure purifies and the second one being that nothing is safe because Let's be honest, especially in this world, I mean, again, go back to the pandemic, we've seen it. Nothing is safe. Any premonition that we have in life, nothing is safe. The next day, everything can change. So mm -hmm. if you kind of just like focus in on that, oh, you know, if you're always resting on those laurels, if like, especially businesses during the pandemic, if you weren't innovating or if you weren't just yeah. moving to try and get something else, if you were trying to continue to play it safe, it's, you, you, there was no safety. What could there you do at that point? It was either, you know, adapt or die. That's right. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's the concept of failure rule number two is nothing is safe, which I, you know, which originated from hearing a quote from Lemmy from Motorhead uh, in an interview where he was talking about uh, their show that was canceled in the UK after the, the terrorist attack at the Ariana Grande show. And they're interviewing they're like, well, what do you think about this? And he's like, look, nothing is safe. I still would have played the next day if the authorities and the cops would, and the venue would have let me. And he's just he's talking about how we just need to live our lives. Mm -hmm. Yes, we still need to try to be as safe as possible. And that makes sense. That's common sense. Right. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the notion that safety must always be first. 
is really a handicap to living a large, loud, and, and impactful life. I mean, those that I admire, um, you know, they, they don't necessarily live recklessly, although there's been mm. increments of that in certain people that I admire, whether it's Johnny Cash or Lemmy from Motorhead. But they realize that if you put safety first all the time when it's not merited, mm. it's going to mute and suppress competing values that are more important, that carry more meaning, and can have more impact on the world. And so the idea that we should be worshiping fucking safety all the time, we really got to get that out of our heads. Uh, you know, it's, I just think it's an impediment to living a large and loud life. Oh, absolutely. And even you think about it from more of a working perspective, from more of, you know, your average American perspective. When I was growing up, it was always the focus was, okay, when you're going to grow up after you graduate high school, you're going to go to college, you're going to graduate college, mm -hmm. you're going to get a good job that's going to, you know, take care of any, like your bills and whatnot. And you're just going to kind of coast through it at that point. But all of a sudden, especially when I was growing up, I saw what happened in 2008 with the housing crisis and then going through college and all of a sudden getting into the working world and just realizing at some point, this is really, really, really boring. Like this is just, there's <laughs> nothing going on here. It's just, what am I doing? I always refer to this Cards Against Humanity card that says, go to college, get a job, get married, have some kids, buy some shit, retire, move to Florida and die. It's like, no, 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 I, yeah. I can't stand yeah. any of that. And that's just that feeling yeah. of like, oh, this might be the safe move to make. Not really, because if you're not necessarily in control at that point, and you know, of course you're never really in control, but at that point you're so much more beholden to whatever your employer is doing, mm -hmm. whatever the market is doing, mm -hmm. because one thing that you have no control over can completely tank you if you're putting so much stock into that illusion of safety. That's right. Yeah. And I, and I talk about that in the book in a variety of ways. I talk about the portfolio pursuits mentality. I use a Gene Simmons quote about it's better to be an octopus than a fish. One tentacle good sliced off, you have seven more. Mm -hmm. and, and I take that that kind of that idea, that picture of the octopus with many tentacles and having a portfolio of pursuits similar to like an investment strategy where you diversify and you have multiple inv investment. That's you know common knowledge. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Everybody does that with investments and savings, right? But I don't think people do that with income streams or even more importantly pursuits that ultimately give you a, like a, a tapestry of meaning inputs right so i know a lot of people that have done well in life uh retired either accidentally or early in a comfortable way even in their 40s uh people i know in my life and um one thing i've kind of noticed is they didn't plan for how they were going to gain fulfillment uh, in that more empty space uh, within a financially free or flexible life and i think for me, that 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 is my goal and vision and approach is to not just build, you know, multiple income streams and, and diversify investments and savings, but diversify my interests, my pursuits so that, yes, some of them are monetized in different degrees or not. But if I have a good portfolio of pursuits at any given time, if one starts carrying lower meaning, it can be you know, compensated by another one that's carrying high meaning. And on the aggregate, the composite, the composite still gives me 100 percent fulfillment. And to me, it's like that is what really gives me a rich life, not monetarily, but just a rich life. Uh, and it also makes you more interesting, makes you more interested, makes you more fun, like makes gives you a more diverse personality. Right. And, and to me, that, that's kind of a prescription that I talk about in the book for, you know, trying to manifest a more, you know, um, meaningful life and fulfilled life. Oh, I am 100 percent with you on there, Andrew, mostly because when I look at life at the same time as well, it's I always look at what's going to be the thing that necessarily what am I going to enjoy? It's I only get one shot at this life. I'm not going to try and just play it safe. You know, I'm not going to try yeah. and swing, get a single and then stand on first and be like, OK, I'm good. Can someone bring me home? No, I'm going to try and figure out something if, you know, say I, like using baseball, say I hit it and maybe it's a double. But, you know, I'm going to try and stretch into a triple or maybe an inside the park home run, because why the hell not? If I only get one shot at this, why don't I actually go for it? And if for some reason I go for it and it doesn't work out, well, the last thing I the one thing I'm not going to be able to do is look back and say, oh, I wish I tried because I tried. I gave it a shot. I'm not going to look back at life and think. I wish I would have done that. I'm not going to look back and just regret decisions that I didn't make. I'm going to look back and think about the times I did do something, the things that I did do, the times that I had, the experiences that I had, and just remember how much fun it was. And I don't know what else I could ask for at that point. No, that's right. I mean, again, another theme of the book is live your life in such a way where you destroy future regret, right? So that what burns inside you doesn't get suffocated, uh, so that you go on to live, like Thoreau said, a quiet life of desperation. You want to avoid that. Instead, you want to find 
practical, strategic ways to bring your North Star dream, your North Star pursuit into reality, which means sometimes you need, need to build a scaff scaffolding, undergirding and support of low meaning pursuits to help you, uh, you know, buy the time, the money and the energy and the focus to, you know, work on your North Star pursuit, you know, on the side as a side hustle. But, you know, like for me, I, I've never let anything that burned inside me from a pr pursuit perspective um, go unpursued, whether it's competing in bodybuilding, starting the record labels, writing a spy novel, doing this book, Failure Rules, other things I've done, opened up a gym, this and that. Um, and I tell you, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm approaching 50 years old. Uh, and while I can look back and say that there's certain uh, ways I went about things that I would do differently to make them more effective or even more safe, even though safety is not my highest value, just because of wisdom and hindsight. Uh, at the same time, man, I am so happy that I didn't cast aside any dreams just because they were too dangerous to pursue, just because they they may have, uh, you know, induced failures necessarily just by chasing after them, because there's still this intangible fruit, particularly of the art that I helped or, the you know, facilitate into the world or music through Sailor's Great Records and Thorpe Records, you know, putting out records by bands like Madball, Blood for Blood, Sheer Terror, U.S. Bombs, Slapshot, uh, the Ducky Boys, Coffin Cats, Mad Sins, shit like that. Like, I'm so happy to have been involved in that. And, and then it's the same way just with art in general, whether it's Failure Rules, Spy Novel. And it's like, I think, you, you know, um, that's part, it's really who this book is for, you know, the creatives those who are trying to align with the most authentic self, the best they know how with the limited, uh, you know, uh, interpretation skills we have as humans. Uh, and those that are chasing after unorthodox career paths that don't have clear blueprints handed down to them by a college professor or a degree. And how do you do that? Let's look at all those who have gone before us. How did they find their hooks into success? Whether it's Bill Burr in comedy, Henry Rollins singing for Black Flag, whether it's Michael Connolly who wrote you know Bosch novels, whether it's um, Gigi Butler, the, the 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 cupcake entrepreneur, whether it's Rodney Dangerfield, going through all these case studies, what did they do to 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 kind of go off road and, and find that adventurous living uh, that was more authentic to them? I mean, Rodney Dangerfield's a great one. He was in his fifties, or I think he was up until he was fifties. He was still trying to make a life in comedy as he was an aluminum aluminum siding salesman. Right. He'd write jokes down in between appointments. He was depressed. You know, he was a victim of anti-Semitic bullying when he was younger. You know, he was divorced, probably a little bit of an alcoholic, all these things going on. But he had this fucking fire inside. And it's that internal spirit voice that he was listening to. And he was a soul on fire, man, uh, just like the name of my, the, my merch company. And he found a way to, you know, just crawl, you know, get into the comedy world, you know. When you have that fire inside of you or when you discover when you have that fire inside of you, it's something that is so infectious and you just have to listen to it. You have to roll with yeah. it and you have to take it to its utmost because even for myself, it was getting out of college. I thought like, oh, you know, maybe that safe path was right for me because there are people that absolutely are fully happy with going down that sure. path of like okay. simplistic handed down to them from He's the resistant. blueprints. Yeah. 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 Like if, if you're happy and that was, that's what makes you happy. Yeah. Go for it. But there's a lot of us that just aren't happy like that. And it just completely killed me inside. But all of a sudden it's once I realized something, once I realized that, you know, maybe music was the thing for me jumping in my first mosh pit and then just getting hit the first time and feeling as energized as I ever have been. It's just like <gasps> something woke up in me. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but then listening to that voice, rolling with it and realizing that there was something inside me that wanted so much more out of life than just that standard blueprint style, cookie cutter, whatever it is. Yeah, it, that's something that you have to drive for. You have to go for because you're going to find so many other interests. You're going to find so many other things about yourself. You're going to discover so much more about yourself. If you find that inner calling, you find that inner voice, you find that inside fire and just run with it. That's right. I mean, I, I have a chapter in the book called Get Used to Unsafe Spaces where I go through the life of Johnny Cash and how he was... You know, he was being recruited by his ex-father-in-law from his first marriage to a uh, Vivian Liberto to just be a salesman. Hence, we have that phrase, hello, I'm Johnny Cash, him knocking on the door about to sell them some shit. I don't even remember what the fuck he was selling, right? And it's like, you know, he couldn't do that. He couldn't suppress that internal spirit voice that was calling him to be expressive through music. He wasn't seeking fame. He wasn't seeking, you know, any, any sort of conformity, even to a musical style. I mean, you know, Folsom Prison Blues was one of the most raw, original 
you know, nerve touching songs of, of that time, you know, but he followed that. But when you do that, oftentimes you're inviting chaos, dysfunction, confusion, tumult, hardship into your life. But if you do that, like Johnny Cash did on the other end, you see, you see that you are, are at the same time, you're traveling into the spaces of highest meaning, right? So you think about, about the, the dichotomy of him being a salesperson. Maybe he would have been had, you know, safe and had a normal, quiet life, but he likely would have been suffocating inside with that dream dying and dying every day. He would have had regret on the deathbed. He would not have, um, you know, lived his life in such a way to manifest his highest usefulness and impact in the world. You know, through the arc of time, he had the act one of his life where he, he um, uh, encountered addictions and tragedy and divorce and all these other things. Act two, he found redemption and light and his music, music, his narrative throughout his career shows this beautiful story of, uh, of just, uh, you know, sin and redemption. Right. And it's like you don't get that. You, we wouldn't have that if he just was a salesman. Yeah, and I think there's another part of the book, too, that you really spoke out to this as well, where you're talking about failure and talking about how, at first, yeah, failure absolutely sucks. It's not going to be good feeling that kind of failure. But as time goes on, if you're able to build from that failure and you're able to succeed off of that and you're able to figure out what you want from that, then that failure is going to end up looking like maybe one of the greatest things to ever happen to you. However, at first, it's still going to absolutely suck. You've got to find a way to break through it, get through it. Think about maybe if you're in the gym lifting and, you know, say you're not feeling it that day and you're trying to get, you know, whatever, whatever you're doing on the bench, maybe you're trying to get 10 reps and you're feeling like you can only get eight and you somehow push yourself to get to that 10. Yeah, it's going to suck trying to get through to that 10. But when you get to that 10, it's going to feel so much better than just that five seconds of relief that you would have gotten had you stopped at eight. That's right. Right. So there's a couple things in the book. I have a definition of terms in the book. So I go through some of the key terms and what they mean within the text. And I talk about the definition of success where it's not based on measurable outcome of, you know, wealth or even achievement, but it's, it's a really measured against, um, you know, events uh, in your life that succinctly join you with your calling journey uh, and your highest usefulness in the world with your own unique talent stack, right? Um, so I think of Thomas Smallwood, who I talked about in the book, a professional bowler, uh, where he was working at the, the Ford plant in Michigan, and he got laid off. And he has this quote where he says, getting laid off was one of the worst things that ever happened to me, but it led to the best results, right? And it's that idea that like, you know, before it rules, failure first sucks, right? And it never feels like a blessing in the heat of its sting, in the heat of its arrival, right? But at that moment, he was in this empty failure space. He leveraged that chaos as an idea engine. He had this latent bubbling dream to become a professional bowler. He used that space to act on it more intently. Uh, and he ended up scrounging up $1,500 uh, and entering a tournament. Uh, and before you know it, at the very same time he's getting a recall to the Ford plant to take his old job back, he's become a professional bowler. And so he takes the call and he's like, yeah, no, nah, sorry. Can't come back to work. But I'll be on ESPN tomorrow bowling if you want to watch me, right? <laughs> but it all started from him getting laid off. In the midst of failure, he rose from the mm -hmm. those ashes and aligned with his true calling journey uh, because of the way he handled it, because the way he responded mm -hmm. to that with creativity and opening up his uh, you know, opportunity palette to, to go, going after what he was born to do. Just rolling like with his creativity and also rolling through that chaos as well, rolling with the punches because when that happens, chaos is going to end up coming into your life. There's yeah. going to be a lot of different things that are going on, realigning mindsets, realigning your schedule, re you know, potentially you're going to end up losing out on some family, some friends, some of that time right. for going right. for this. And you have to be able to roll with that. You have to be able to understand that and work alongside of it because if you're going to be so heavily resistant towards it, could you get through it? That you might, I'm not going to lie, you might, but it's going to be so much harder and you might end up suppressing that inner calling, that calling journey that's inside of you to really just make the most out of it. And if um, that would have happened, you might have gone back to the Ford plan. He might not have been a professional bowler. He might like, there's so many different variables that can happen with it. But when times like that happen, when you get to those failure moments and you start going after what you want to go after, your calling journey, you know what that is and you're going to go after it. Chaos is going to come in your life roll with it, work That's alongside right. it, That's figure right. out what to do with it so that you can be make it to, an advantage to yourself and not a burden. Because chaos is an energy like anything else, right? 
And when we have any energy in life, what do we want to do? We want to get our arms around it and we want to be able to shape it to our benefit. Chaos is no different. It's not necessarily meant to hurt us. It can be a, a, a great reshuffling of our priorities, of our opportunities, of everything else. And so we have to weave through the temporary pain and discomfort and sometimes negative effects of chaos. And we have to find the cracks in that chaos or, or the energy in that chaos that we can use to our advantage and steer us into new directions, right? And that takes like an intentional approach. You need to think about it ahead of time. When it happens, you need to step back from the cyclone of emotions that emerge and you need to really look at it Take that time to hear internal spirit voice and think of all possible possible options. Think about who you really are or who you're becoming and, and what that looks like and how you can join that with that chaos and let that chaos be be a tailwind for you instead of a headwind. As the best personification of that in a real life example, probably a mosh pit. You, think about <laughs> That's right. it. That's right. Say, seriously, think about it. <laughs> It's it's either it's either gonna kick your ass or you're gonna find energy and 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 uh, power and meaning and life and creativity and and uh, and a kick ass release from it, right? No, oh, absolutely. Because I'll just I'll see one I'll see one form and my mind just goes like I'm like a little kid on Chris. I'm like <gasps> must go now. Even the day before we shot this, I end up going to see uh, Slaughter to Prevail. So I'm going to a, a deathcore match with a bunch of big dudes. And I'm thinking the whole entire time before it starts. Can we get going now? Like, I'm excited for this. The chaos around there. I mean, you're going to end up getting hit a, a bunch of times. You might get hit in the face. You might fall down. There's so many things going on there. But it's how do you respond to that? How do you work alongside yeah. that? What kind of energy can that chaos bring to you? And what kind of positivity can you get to that chaos to the point where, I mean, I'm still living I'm still living off this, the amped upness, and the yeah. adrenaline from that show right now. I was listening to Sark Prevailing before we started this to keep that going. And I mean, I'm... I'm still feeling it right now. And it's just using that for so much positivity. That's what happens when you're able to take that chaos and figure mm -hmm. out what you can do with it in order to make it the biggest positive for yourself. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, Bob Dylan said, chaos is a friend of mine. You got to make it, make it a friend of yours, you know, but I mean, I think about moshing, right. And the energy that comes from that or, or the almost spiritual feeling I feel when I'm in a mosh pit where you have that electric moment of connecting with the lyrics, feeling the, the music, you know, pulsing through your fucking blood and veins right there in front of the artist, right? You're amongst your tribe. You are also feeling the same sensibility. I mean, it's it's that chaos and that energy that, to me, mirrors in a metaphorical way, just life, the unpredictability of life, the need in life to, to go through and find that connectivity with a like-minded tribe and to embrace that chaos together with a, a like-minded tribe. That's what the fucking pit is. You're with, you're with with that like-minded tribe and you're embracing chaos. You're making it your own. You're enjoying the, 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 the energy and, and, and the, and the, and the, the craziness of, of, of that moment. And to me, it just mirrors life. You know, it's very metaphorical to life in general for, uh, you know, at least a life in my mind that's, um, hmm. you know, lived with, uh, with uh, enthusiasm and, and boldness. Oh, absolutely. I'm totally with you on that one. Even to kind of go through it too. There's been times where I've gone into concerts where I have not felt the best. There was one time last year where I was laying on my kitchen floor, figuring out how the hell was I going to still get down to Chicago to see my favorite band? I'm like, I don't know how I'm supposed to do this, but I know how much like that chaos, I know how much that, like what that inner calling is, what that calling journey is, where that passion lies with music and how much energy it brings me. So I somehow managed to get myself off the floor, go down to the Aragon Bar in Chicago, I remember standing in the crowd thinking, there is no way that I'm going to be doing this. I am hurt. I am feeling sick. Like, I am out of it. The first note for the first song plays, and instantly my energy went from nothing yeah. to, oh, yeah. I'm going to go absolutely ape That's crazy right. for this whole entire set. So, yep, I have, I've, I've said to my friends, if for some reason something ever happens to me where it looks like I'm not going to make it, Someone get me tickets to go see Rise Against. I will be sure to be there in that pit when it happens. Like that energy just drives. And I use that energy when it comes to the podcast as well to continue to drive forward in those moments of I am done. Like I got no energy, but yeah. to find a way to bring that inner, like that inner Fine, fire, that cold journey back up, just bring that fire back up. So like fuel it and just let that flame, yeah. you know, go full on. Like if you threw a whole entire can of lighter fluid in a fire pit. Yeah. That's what I do with it, when, and it's fun. I hear you, man. I remember, I mean, I'm a little older than you, so I remember years ago, this 20, 25 years ago, when I was competing in bodybuilding and I was, you know, amidst a hard diet and I had low energy. Uh, I went to see one of my favorite bands back in the day, Vision of Disorder, 
I don't know if you've heard of Vision of the VOD, Vision of the Disorder. Oh, yeah. Uh, talking to her in Philly, and I'm like, you know, guys, I'm not going to dance tonight. I'm really tired. Trained all day. I got to train tomorrow. My show's coming up, blah, blah, blah. I remember being in the fucking balcony. As soon as that first song hit, I'm like, fuck this. And all of a sudden, I just came alive with so much energy, and I lost my mind. I went down the first floor and, and just lost my mind. It's got that power. It's got that just summoning power, and it's uh, it's one of the ama- most amazing things in the world. Uh, so I have a son who's uh, 21 years old, and um, you know, like me, he's uh, he, he he's he's uh, he's into music, uh, more into like I guess alternative culture or whatever. He's got dreadlocks and tattoos and, and all of that, but he, he's into rap. He's he's not really in, in metal or hardcore or anything, but there is some crossover. So he's into bands like Suicide Boys, who have on their tours they'll have hardcore bands or you know, uh, somewhat hardcore bands, Turnstile or Knock Loose on the bill. Uh, and uh, I, I'll never forget. He sent me a video of him and his first mosh pit at a Suicide Boy show, and it was like I was like it was like two or three years ago. It was like a proud papa, you know what I mean? <laughs> like uh, most dads wouldn't understand that. They'd want to just know, uh, you know, what the score was in his first little league game. But for me, the moment of seeing my boy in his first mosh pit on his own accord with his own genre, not mine, mm-hmm. right? Like he's not trying to be like his dad. He's just being himself. That was like a really cool moment and something that. Uh, you know, gave me back the memories of what it was like to go into pits when I was, uh, you know, my late teens and early 20s and, and just discovering just the, the beauty and the power of that. And that's just also like a piece to remember as well for even other pursuits that you're going after in life at the moment. You think about, you know, your son and think about just that moment when he's jumping into his first pit for his own genre on his own accord. Yeah. Just f- seeing that passion, seeing that fire, seeing that happiness just come through him. It's like, well, man. This is awesome. And it inspires you to continue to go after your own things as well. Go after right. what you really want to go after. Go after all these other different aspects. You know, the octopus with all the eight tentacles. What you <laughs> what what are you gonna grow a ninth one and grab onto something else now? That's right, right. Yeah, you keep growing it, right. As long as it's maintainable. Yeah. As long as it's maintainable. One of the main things from the uh, five rules of failure, one that really stuck out to me, I do want to talk about was rule number four, build your thing one and thing two dependency. Like there was that one, when I first saw the rule, I thought, what in the heck is Andrew even talking about? Then I started to read through what you meant. And literally I thought, I thought to myself, if this rule doesn't apply to me, absolutely hundred percent right now, I don't know what does. Yeah, so like that rule is really the reality check, right? I mean, the rest of the rules I'm talking about, not grandiose, real stories of entrepreneurs and creatives and how they made their way and often took really crazy risks to go off road to chase a dream and, you know, encountered sometimes hard times, you know, Henry Rollins on, on the road eating dog food and Black Flag long before he's getting a Grammy for his audiobook reading of Get in the Van, right? But thing one and thing two dependency, I think, really then grounds the reader and say, okay, you need to, to identify and figure out a plan to chase after your North Star, uh, you know, dream pursuit, mm. but it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Nothing is safe, failure rule number two, which means even your chasing of your dream is not safe. And because it's not safe, even though we don't value safety as our highest value, you still want to be able to achieve it with as little failure as possible. This is the failure prevention rule, right? So it's mm. around building that, uh, that undergirding that really gives you the space potentially the, the financing to go after your North Star dream. So how are you going to creatively structure your life so that you can do both? So you can maintain maybe a low meaning job that supports you uh, or even a quickened path towards financing and enabling your thing to North, North Star dream. So it's everything from the North, holding down the nine to five uh, and, and slowly building your dream on the side to more creative ways of approaching it. Like um, an example in the music world, Chris Wren from Bridge Nine Records, who's released you know awesome records from bands like H2O and Terror and Agnostic Front, Strike Anywhere. His record label was entirely underwritten by a, another entrepreneurial pursuit, potentially low meaning to him, right? It wasn't as as uh, aspirational and as important to him as his record label. He created Yankee Suck merch and sold it at Fenway or wherever the you know Red Sox fans were, and made a, a good amount of money off that. And that profit which some would say is throwing good money after bad if you're looking at a pure financial business sense, but that profit underwrote all the early Bridge Nine records, right? So that, like, that's a creative way of building a thing one, because Yankee sucks, and thing two, North Star Dream, Bridge Nine records, thing one and thing two, dependency. And so that I think really typifies this idea, find creative ways to bring your dream into reality, because it doesn't happen in a vacuum. And if you go at it straight ahead many times, you might fail sooner 
harder unnecessarily, right? So it's a matter of finding ways to do that. And again, that's the creative way to do it in a quickened path. Find these punk rock circumventing creative ways. The other way is the slow cook. You know, it, it's it's the crock pot. It's grind the day job and find a little bit of time in nights and weekends to slowly crawl towards your dream. So a lot of people do it in different ways, but I go through a lot of different examples of that model in the book. Yeah, you definitely go through a lot of different examples. And when I looked at that one, because what got me going on that one is, of course, you have the virtual model, which has more of that passive generative income yep. to really yep. fund the your, your calling journey, fund what's going on there, or the active model, which is more of the potentially getting creative, like with Yankees suck, creatively creating something else, or working that nine to five that's going to take a lot more time and energy and just you know, your physical presence. Cause if you're doing a, like, if you're going to be working a full-time job, whether it's something in finance, whether it's something that's going to be sitting in a computer or whether it's something that's physical manual labor, you physically are going to have to be there and do something with that. So right. it's going to be something that's going to, you know, it's, it's not going to be your, your passion. It's going to be right. low meaning to you. And that's totally understandable because your thing too, that's your calling journey. That's what you want to go after. So it's about trying to make sure whatever your thing one is can do a number of things. One to be able to, and I remember reading this in the book, and this is the thing that stuck out to me, preventing the preventable failures. So if it's somewhere, you know, if like a like a full-time job, yeah, maybe it's not the best situation where it's taking away time from your from what you're able to do with your calling journey. However, it's gonna still help you finance that. You're not gonna constantly run into problems where how am I gonna get money to make sure I make it this month or be to get to this point. It's you're still going to have that sort of revenue income at some point. Passive, yeah, it's a little bit better. Also a little bit tougher to get to because you got to find a way to create that on your own. But there is so much there that just speaks to being able to prevent those preventable failures because there's going to be some big ones that happen that you can't really prevent. And that's when you have to roll with the chaos and figure out how you're going to get around it and work alongside it. But those small preventative ones, those are things that can just, if you spend so much time on those and having to fix those, that can absolutely tank your passion that can just really just kill your whole entire momentum and then you start to feel like you're not gonna be able to do it and then you start to drift into that fallacy of safety of i'm just gonna get a full-time job and then move to florida and die and shit (laughs) that's right move to florida and die no you're right because the 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 self-evident unspoken failure role is try to avoid it as much as possible i mean that's just obvious right um so i i you know I explicitly say that at the beginning of that rule here is like, yeah, I'm writing a book on the value of failure. Yeah, I'm saying failure rules with a fist in the air and an exclamation mark. That's all true, true, right? And failure only rules after it sucks. But at the same time, you do want to avoid it. So let's talk about what that looks like or how to mitigate it while you're also preparing to leverage it and grow from it when it inevitably happens when you're going down an unsafe road or an unorthodox path, right? Mm -hmm. So the other cool thing about thinking about the thing one and thing two dependency you know, the thing one enabler pursuit that allows you to build your North Star uh, dream is when you do that, like the Bridge Nine story or like another story I go through in the book where these two brothers I knew, um, uh, I anonymized them in the book, but they were uh, a Shia Muslim uh, background uh, and they came over here from uh, Lebanon and um, they needed seed money to start some businesses because to them, that's how they were going to find their, their, you know, pursue their happiness in, in, in the U.S., and um, they didn't have it, right? So they came up with this idea to go work for Disney on Ice, which covered their lodging and their food. So they had no home for years. I mean, it was like they're on the road. The, the, the road was a bride. And um, for several years, they just saved up cash, selling swag to, 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 to the moms of little girls for Disney on Ice shit. Uh, and then they came back and built a retail empire where they ended up owning gyms and and cigar lounges and gas stations and, and strip clubs. And, and that became their empire. But think about the rich narrative, both of that example and the bridge nine example where, okay, when you start telling the story of how you got to where you were, think about how much more meaning and how cool that story is to talk about how you went about doing it, right? The complexity of coming up with that creative enabler idea. Uh, and so I think there's a beauty even in just the, in just the meaning of that narrative over time on how you got there. Because sometimes the achievement in cell itself isn't half as enjoyable or meaningful as, as, as the journey. And if the journey is interesting and clever and creative like that, I just think it brings so much more texture to your story and to your life. Yeah, I think it was one of, because I always end up listening, especially when I was trying to build up and figure out what I want to do with my life and figure out with what I wanted to start out with and getting to the podcast. One thing I always, one person I was listening to was Gary Vee. He was like the guy that yeah. just kind of stuck in my head. 
And one thing that he always kept saying was like, enjoy the process, enjoy the process. And that's kind of getting that it's, you're going to want to get to that end point. Absolutely. You're going to want to get to that end goal. But if you don't enjoy ever like the single step of the process of, okay, starting out, going through those failures, figuring out how to navigate through the chaos, getting those small wins. If you're not enjoying every oh, aspect of it and you're just, you're not fired up by that. What's the point? Like it's, it's just not going to be there. And that's when you hear people talk about their stories, especially ones that have made and have gone through so much to get there. It's no one's really curious about, Oh, what are you necessarily doing right now? It's how did you get to this point? And everyone wants to hear that. So everyone wants to talk about, because there is so much there, there is so much context. There's so much just stuff. To, I don't know what, how to describe, but it's just, there's so much to grab onto that we just want to listen to it. We want to understand it. And we want to feel like we can do that too, because at times those stories are absolutely inspirational. When you people are writing professional development books like yourself, and you're including all these other stories in there as examples, and you're bringing up people like Lemmy from Motorhead, Henry Rollins, I'm looking through this and all of a sudden I'm excited to see what did these people do? What are these stories about to you know, get from maybe what they end up failing in to now where they are. What's that story like? And when people make documentaries about people that have done this stuff, it's not about, they, they never spend enough time. They don't spend any time really on, oh, this is where they're at right now. What a success. No, it's all about where they started and how they got there. Right. Everyone wants to know the origin story. Why do you think superhero movies always start out with the origin story? Well, yeah. one, because people need to get into it and know where this hero came from. But that's why we start out with it. You want to feel, you want to feel like you went on that ride with them. Yeah, and, and people are more inspired by stories that, frankly, have more obstacles and failures in them. Uh, again, you don't want to induce failures. You don't want to chase after failures. You want to avoid them, but they are going to come. And for those who have those stories where they're literally crafted through hard times and failures and they find ways to overcome in very unique, impactful, and profound ways, they're the best fucking stories. I mean, they're the stories I tried to pick, but I also tried to pick ones that were relatable, right, that weren't necessarily I mean, sure I have, you know, billionaire uh, Sarah Blakely in there. And so there's some people that seem unrelatable. But if you look at their origin story, they're actually not unrelatable. I mean, Sarah Blakely started out with a $5,000 investment, uh, you know, for Spanx uh, in this pantyhose variation where nobody was even listening to her. Nobody thought it was a good idea until one factory owner uh, got the input from his three daughters from a female perspective and found out that it was a good idea and took a chance on her. So like, even though she's a billionaire now, she seems unrelatable. The origin story is not. And that's what we need to focus on is these all start somewhere. They start at very humble and or relatable and or practical origin stories that we can learn a lot from. Oh, absolutely. And that's one of the biggest things when it comes to failure rules, especially when you get to rule number four with the thing, one thing, two dependency. When you when I've been looking through other different, you know, professional development aspects and other books, there's a lot of them that they kind of go through more of the concept of it, more of the theory of it. But there aren't that many that end up bringing you back to reality that really ground you into something to really give that point where, you know, now everything's up in the air. And they're, for a lot of people, they just want, okay, we have to get the, we got the ideas in our head, but where's the potential starting point? And where's something that we can just like grasp onto? And when you get to rule number four with building your thing, one and thing two dependency, when you get grounded in that reality, it's like, okay, now I've got something tangible that I can really understand that I can work with. And then I can start to really move forward on like when I was getting into my stuff with Gary V like reading, crushing it from him. One thing that stuck out to stood out to me was just, okay, now he's going through all these different aspects of social media. Of course you got the other stories in there, but there's the concept around it, but then there's the reality behind it of not only, you know, what other people do, but what you're doing as well and giving you an idea of it, giving you a potential, like, you know, not necessarily a roadmap, but just already, here's where the starting line is. Now, whatever direction you want to go in, go, but here's exactly. where the line is. Yeah. And, 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 you know, also within the failure rule, number four rule in the chapters there, and I talk about like the importance of balancing, uh, you know, a realistic mentality with your aspirational dreams. Because they're two opposing forces in many ways, right? It's very hard to like engage yourself in the fantasy of a life you don't have yet that you want, and at the same time stare down the realities of the moment, the realities of the day, the the, the minutia and mon monotony of the day, and try to figure out how one connects to the other, how one might possibly lead to the other. So that's the type of thing I'm talking about there. And and what is key is really still having that you know responsibility uh, and and that, uh, that you know versatility within you to be able to bear the burdens you need to bear today face down the realities you need to face today with integrity and with responsibility. And at the same time, figure out those creative paths 
carve off that isolated time to protect your North Star dream and build towards that. And so that's a very difficult thing to do. And it often takes a long time and a long tail, long game kind of mentality. And that's also key to the to the thing one and thing two dependency model. Well, another thing that really is going to be, a, I think, another important piece of that is when it comes to, you know, what you want in reality and what the actual reality of the situation is, is balancing out what is important to you outside of your North Star journey, outside of your calling journey and the other things in life that you enjoy. Cause you might want to have, you might want to go a bunch of different ways. Maybe you're also, you know, if you're into music, maybe you're also into fitness, maybe you're also into a different creative space, but then you also have your family, your friends, yourself as well. And one of the biggest things that in my experience that has been, you know, one of the biggest challenges, but one of the biggest rewards is figuring out exactly what other things I value in life. And on top of that, where can I cut out other things that are going to be things I have to take care of, but what can I cut down on? What can I not do as much in order to make sure that it ends up hitting? And for myself, after a while, I kind of learned how to only function on like five hours of sleep very consistently. So it's, yeah, I'm not going to get as much sleep as possible. I might lose out on some personal time for myself, but I get to focus as much time as I want on the podcast. I still have to go to a nine to five job, which kind of sucks, but hey, I'm able to yeah. still do it. And I found a way yeah. to make it work for myself to the point where, yeah, no one's really watching over me like in right. an office setting. And I always have my other my laptop next to me. So, oh, I've got a break here for a half hour. Now it's time to go over here and maximize on the time here with friends, going to concerts, being able to go to the gym and being in the healthiest shape that I want to be in. Yeah, there's a lot of things I have to give up. And for me, it was giving up things for that I would do myself, just like time spent by myself, just alone, relaxing time, sleeping, because I get so much energy off of what my calling journey is that I'm yeah. going to ride that and just really work off of that so that I can get more time to put into this stuff, that I get more time to do the things I want to do so that when I get older in life, yeah, I want to look back and enjoy the times I had and not the times that I slept. There are times I'll go to concerts in the middle of the week, like I did the day before we recorded this, down to Chicago from Milwaukee, because I'll think about this. What am I going to remember the next couple of days? Am I going to remember going to that show and having a fun time? Or am I going to remember getting enough sleep for work the next day? And it's always number one. <laughs> it's always number one. No, that's true. Right? I mean, you bring up a good point. It's how do you integrate the appropriate value and balance of friends and family when you're driven, when you have a portfolio of pursuits and various interests, and when you have a very robust work-life tapestry. That's something I've, I guess, struggled with, but I actually feel like I'm in a really great spot with that. And I don't know that I'd say if I've mastered it, but I think I've done really, really well with it. And I, I, I really try to, um, you know, um, create a life where I'm maximizing the time I spend with friends and families, but I also cut out frivolous social time. So if I sense that there's an environment or a setting of, of frivolous social time that has kind of expired its you know real value after a certain amount of hours or whatever, maybe you know partying too late into the night with uh, certain groups or what have you, I've really cut out that, uh, yet still keeping in touch with certain people uh, so that I can then pivot back into keeping moving the things in my calling journey because that ultimately gives me fulfillment and satisfaction when I wake up in the morning and will be the things that uh, I look back to on my on my deathbed as being as being uh, me me living out my highest uh, usefulness in the world um, but at the same time like family and friends are vital they're important mm -hmm. and uh, you don't want you know you don't want to kind of like verge into uh, toxic ambition and uh, neglect those core pieces of your life, right? Because they really are the things that transcend failures when you have good family and good friends. Oh, absolutely. And it's, again, it's not about, like you said, that toxic ambition where it's just you're so focused in on that, that you're going to alienate your family and friends at the same time. Because even for, we've gone through it as well, both of us, when failures have hit, they're kind of the support system that when maybe you're just kind of just not as inspired, maybe you're just a little bit lost. They're the ones that are going to still be behind you and help you get back up to that point. They're the people, they're the people in the mosh pit. When you get knocked down, they're going to pick you right back up so you can get going crazy and you can start pushing some people around and you can start working through that chaos once again. And how that looks for everybody, everybody is completely different. When it comes to myself, it's there's going to be a certain weight I put on things with friends, weight I put on things with family. And then 
you know, you might be different. Maybe you're much more into family than friends. Maybe you're much more into friends than family. It doesn't really matter what that is, but make sure you still maintain those positive relationships right. in right. your life with the people close to you alongside your ambition as well. That's when everything really starts to feel like it comes together. That's when you get into this. I'm not going to say it's into the safety net, but it's you get into this, you get in this lane where your ambition, you're going absolutely after your ambition, but you also have that support system behind you when those failures do happen. And when you need that time to just kind of get away from it, maybe you're time to clear your head and just feel that right. relationship aspect really come through. Go spend time with your family. Don't miss out on holidays. I'm not, I mean, when you're saying missing out on like frivolous time out with your friends, yeah, that is one thing as a huge thing to cut out. Don't just go out to go. If you're going to go and do something, go and do something, go and do it with meaning because that's when things mean a lot more instead of just sitting around, maybe sitting around in someone's basement, you know, maybe smoking some pot and be like, what are we going to do today? I yeah. don't know. Now, you know what? Talking. Yeah. I was like, no, you're you know right. What? That's exactly it. It's, it's, it's having the discernment and the wisdom to know, okay, who, who are the friends that there's mutuality where we both build each other up? Who are the family members where there's mutuality when we hang out together, where we both leave feeling a sense of connection and feeling a sense that we've really built each other up uh, and uh, added value to each other, right? Because of love or loyalty or uh, personality chemistry, whatever it is. And then the ones that don't really fit into that bucket, you have to politely find a way to minimize their, their, their your time with them. <laughs> Otherwise, it will kind of drain you from some of the energy that you need to put forth into your calling journey. Oh, absolutely. I mean, even for myself, I still remember all, like I had a lot of friends, especially, you know, end of high school and like, okay, now I've got to hang out with all these people. This is kind of cool and whatnot. All of a sudden really start focusing on the podcast. And yeah, a lot of those friends where I'd go out and maybe spend that frivolous time, that frivolous social time with them. I haven't seen them since 2018. And I, is, is it, do I some of the times that we had? Yeah, but I don't really miss out on that. There are friends that I see a good considerable amount of time, but it's when we spend time together, there is such a focus on just how important that time is to the point where, oh, I get to see one of my friends from Minnesota. I've seen him twice this year. One time was just, he came in with his wife. They were driving through, stopped at a restaurant. Okay, I'll go hang out with you. Other time, he messages me. Yeah, my wife is pregnant. I want to do one more festival this year. You want to go? I'm like, oh yeah. So we spent four days in a mosh pit just going nuts and I look at that and I'm thinking now that is the kind of stuff that you want to do where I'm going to look back in, you know, 20, 30 years. I'm not going to really remember the time we just sat around and did nothing. I That's remember right. the time we went, had, right. went to a mosh pit, got drunk with a, with a dad and his two sons in the parking lot for four days straight and just had an absolute blast. Like yeah. that's yeah. what I'm going to remember. Right. So it's even planning your, your social time, your leisure to be adventurous and maximized and, uh, you know, from a relationship standpoint and experience standpoint. And it's exactly what I'm talking about. It's it's a it's a total approach to your whole life to want to maximize things, uh, you know, to the fullest. And and for everyone listening too, it's, I'm not gonna lie. At at the first step of it, like at the first when you start it, it is scary because you're going from something that you may have known for a long time and you're used to to now a different mindset, a different idea. Even though you're going after what's gonna make you happy and what you truly feel is like crawling during inside you. But your lifestyle is going to potentially change. You're going to end up missing out on some of those things. You're going to end up losing some of those friendships that you think are very important to you, but end up just yeah. being more for that frivolous time. It's going to be tough. It's not going to be comfortable. But in the end, I think it was good old Tom Hanks that said, if it was easy, then everyone would do it. This isn't yeah. easy. But if you are, if you have that passion inside you, you know what your calling is. You're going to go after your North Star. You're going to follow it. You're going to go for it. You're going to end up having to do these things. It's not going to be the easiest thing, but... Let me tell you, it's going to be worth it in the end because, whoo, man, you're going to feel good once you get to that point of just, you know what? I'm on, even if you're not that to the success point yet, when you're on the path to it. On the path, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's I, back to the process of, over, over achievement. Do you want to achieve? Sure. Are you aiming to achieve? Sure. But you have to love and enjoy the process. You have to love the small wins. You have to love mm -hmm. the cool people you meet along the way, the connections you meet along the way, you know, the podcast you go on, the conversations like this. This has to be just as much of the pleasure as uh, looking at the, at the report that tells you how many books you sold or how many records you sold, right? Like you have to enjoy the process or in your case, how many views or how many, you know, what, how many ratings on, uh, on Apple Podcasts. Like all those metrics are great. You got to track them. That's important. It's feedback. Sure. But the goal mostly is to be able to keep doing it, right? Like, like, you know, you don't go to a gas station because you love gasoline. It's because you want to get on the road and enjoy the journey. 
You just need gasoline to do it. And so a lot of these other things is I feel like we also oftentimes are focusing on the gasoline and worshiping the gasoline when we really just need the gasoline to get on the road and enjoy the ride. Oh, absolutely. I look at the gasoline in that aspect as just looking at the metrics where it's something I'm going to have to look at. Am I going to get excited when all of a sudden, you know, like with gasoline, when price goes down or for me, when the streams go up per per day yeah. or per week or per month? Yeah, I'm going to get excited about that when I get more reviews. Yeah, I'm going to get excited for it. But there is still no energy like every single time I jump out of Zoom. Every single time I see that thing hop in the corner that says this person is in the waiting room. I have been absolutely energy just dead. But I know when I see that call in there, all of a sudden that adrenaline energy just goes up, 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 up. And I enjoy this so much to the point where, yeah, especially during, you know, the beginning of this, I was bringing, I was bringing on just very, very, very small bands because that's what I had to do. But figuring out exactly how I enjoyed it with talking to people, having these conversations, learning more about music, sharing stories, just hearing all this fun stuff and just meeting all these different people. My God. Yeah, it's it's still as energizing to me today as it was when I first started doing this. And that's really what it means for me, especially when it comes to enjoying the journey, when it comes to just putting this stuff together and then in the back end, putting all the extra material together for it with the crazy little like TikTok, Instagram, real YouTube short stuff. Yeah, pull out some funny stuff in there. And it's just like, OK, if I didn't enjoy actually making this stuff and I saw it as much more of a burden. Yeah, it was going to be a slog to get there. It'd be tougher. But if I'm enjoying the journey on that. And I said, take a look at the metrics every once in a while is the gas. I'm much more focused on let's get to that. Let's do the journey. Let's get there instead of, oh, filling up. Yay. Right, right, (laughs) right. Yeah, right. Or, oh, not as much gasoline as I thought this time. But I have enough to keep going. And that's what's Mm -hmm. important. You know, I I talk about that in the book. Amidst failure, right? One One of the best things to do or strategies to outrun the brutality of certain failures is to find within that chaos and that failure what still exists that has trajectory that has some micro momentum that you can hyper focus on and help that to be like the the uh, you know uh, the adrenaline to keep you going through the pain of that failure right so it's like you know you always have to find that one or two things amidst uh, failure or disarray that can keep you going uh, it goes back to one of the main anchor quotes that really inspired me to write this book from Winston Churchill when he said, success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. So to me, no matter what's going on, I'm always finding enthusiasm and inspiration in something. And that always carries me into new territory, regardless of what failure strike and allows me to keep going from, uh, you know, uh, North Star Pursuit to North Star Pursuit so that I am always satiated. I've always known and I've chased after everything that's burned inside me uh, to the fullest extent to avoid that uh, deathbed regret scenario. And the way you can tell that that's true just from hearing you talk, it's the enthusiasm that's in your voice when you speak about this stuff. That's where you can tell this is coming from a place of absolute truth. There is no way that anyone can look at this and say, oh, no, he's just bullshit on this. Hell no. (laughs) There's just that energy that's behind you when you're talking about this, man, that it's infectious. It's infectious to hear to the point where anyone who is in that creative space that wants to find that thing to them, again, if you are very comfortable with the nine to five life, that, you know, cookie cutter lifestyle, perfect, go for it. If that's what you, and that's what really drives you, go for it. But if you're in that more of that entrepreneurial creative aspect of it, yeah, there's going to be a lot of times you're going to end up running into certain failures here and there. But speaking it from speaking to someone in yourself, Andrew, who has gone through those different failures, who's gone through many of those things and has succeeded off of them and hearing the passion that you still have for all these different things that you're doing, there is no way that people can't just like listen to this and be like, or read this book and be like, oh, this is just one of those other books. It's like, all right, let's go. Um, What's the what's the next thing we need to do to get to our next like point in the, in the journey? What's the next step that we have to right, get to now. so we can get, to, yeah, it's that energizing moment. And yeah. I mean, even after talking with you right now, I'm wondering, okay, I've got two other podcasts I have to shoot this evening that we're recording this. What can I do in between that time to make this even better? Yeah. So to that point, I'll give you one story, right? So there there was a time in my my journey where I was, um, I exited the online lending space after a business divorce with a partner that uh, was very contentious. Uh, It put me in a a temporary adverse financial situation from that business engagement. I was contending with a a federal investigation uh, that ultimately was dismissed. I was contending with several multimillionaires uh, threatening to sue me, some actually suing me. Uh, I was uh, walking through a, a marital divorce. Uh, I was at a position where 
because of the business divorce and marital divorce. I was living in a hotel room. I had no uh, no office to go to by day, no home to go to by night. In that space, it was the song Divinity of Purpose by Hatebreed that really spoke to me. Uh, I'll read the lyrics to uh, Divinity of Purpose uh, from Jamie Josta. I felt the pain of discipline was less than that of regret, lifted one foot from the grave when the purpose showed its face, and when the skies crashed down upon me, I looked for someone by my side. You were there when no one else was. You showed me what's born doesn't always die, divinity of purpose. So that song, which is also the name of that album, just buoyed me. And so within that failure space, instead of you know wallowing in alcohol, alcoholism, and I'm no stranger to alcohol, I'm drinking tequila right now, I love alcohol, but instead of wallowing in alcoholism or despair or regret, I embraced enthusiasm, found my divinity of purpose. And in that space, five things were born. I, uh, I ended up uh, starting a consulting business with the online lending company, which merged into a proper partnership for a lead generation company that uh, th that ended up eclipsing income more than uh, the day job that I acquired during that space in the fintech banking space, which I still hold today. That was also born out of that space where I redid my resume and networked and, and got a job uh, in, the, uh, in the fintech banking space, which for me at the time, going from being an online lender which is akin to, to payday lending and has a lot of controversy around it, to being a proper banker in the fintech space. That was like being a, a porn star and finding a regular acting job. So that accomplishment occurred during that space. I finished my first buy novel. I began the manuscript for Failure Rules, and this was back in uh, 2013, end of 2013. Um, and I also resurrected investment into Sailor's Great Records and released some records, including Booze and Glory, a great oi band from England, uh, Creep Show, which is a a killer psychobilly band from from Canada. So within that space, I found fucking enthusiasm, and I resurrected five tentacles of my portfolio of pursuits, and they all had different levels of success and prosperity at different paces, but they all bore fruit because of the way that I handled that chaos. And and, and it was all to me buoyed by music, which is why I have a soundtrack to Failure Rules and Spotify and Apple Music. Divinity of Purpose by Hey Breed is one of the key songs on there. It's also a defined term in the book. So. You know, it, it really comes back to that enthusiasm that Churchill talked about that really is is, is is the powerful tool to to traverse through the brutality of failure. Oh, absolutely. And the fact that you have a whole entire soundtrack around there as well. People can go on Spotify and look at that soundtrack and just see where this entire just energy and this aspiration, this enthusiasm comes from you. Hell, I might have to make my own soundtrack for that because there's a couple of songs I'm already peeking in my head when you're talking about I'm like, Wait a minute, I wonder if this song is on here. And then I'm looking like into the camera, looking at my back, like looking what's behind me. I'm just thinking, yep, even the song that's on the wall right there with my giant We Came As Romans flag, yep, that would definitely work because the bottom says die or grow. It's like when when you go through adversity, you have two choices. You can that's either right. fall apart or you can go find a way through it, work through it with enthusiasm. And it could be one of the worst things to happen, like with We Came As Romans losing Kyle Pavone. Yeah, like that's a major part of it. It's a, that's someone that they've been so close to, and they ended up figuring out a way to not only continue on without him, but continue to like have his memory still be as strongly as part of a band as possible. So it's kind of like for me, it's like even when I'm down and out, it's I'll just throw on some We Came From, throw on Dark Bloom, and I'm just flying right now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's what music is to me, man. It's like a soundtrack to my life. Like, I didn't just pick the songs as songs I like. These were literally songs where the lyrics and the music and the power of the music actually gave me strength during, during real complex hard times in my life, the hard times I write about in the book. So these songs are literally the songs that were part of helping me get through. I mean, everything from Madball to Terror to Hate Breed to, to Black Flag to Rancid to Kings of Nothing, Sheer Terror, you know, Flatfoot 56, all kinds of bands. A couple of them were on my label, but most of them were weren't. So I just, I, I put the songs that literally were the ones uh, that informed my power during these failure times. That'd be kind of a cool exercise for not only myself, but also for everyone else to do is just kind of go through and create a playlist of the songs that, you know, you listen to. It can be some of your favorite songs. It could be songs that just randomly popped on that for some reason just stuck out in your head and just inspired you to just go forward, just to keep going at something, just to make sure that even when, you know, in the worst possible times, this was the thing that got me past it. This is the song that represented what got me past it. Because it could be a, it could be a song that makes no sense at that time, but for some reason, you connected right. with, with so much emotionally, so much with your energy, so much with your enthusiasm, that it could be a sad song, but it could be the thing that literally took that downturn in your life and was the thing that just turned it back up. It could be the song that represents that moment for you. 
Yeah, and it could be even something that's even non-representative of your, your normal musical taste. So obviously, I love hardcore punk and metal, and and mostly like old New York hardcore type style or street punk and oi and psychobilly. But on the soundtrack, I even have songs like Machine Gun Kelly, who I don't even really listen to. But when I was going through a really hard time, my son son was really into him, and uh, he let me hear of it. And there was one song that just struck out to me and ended up on the soundtrack because it really became an anthem for me during that time. I don't know any of his new stuff. Don't really follow him. Not like a huge fan, but that one song did mean something to me during that time. So I authentically put it on the soundtrack. And it wouldn't be right if you didn't put it authentically in the soundtrack because it's what you connected with. It's what you felt. So it needs to be there. That's right. That's right. It absolutely, absolutely needs to be there. And when it comes to failure, yeah, it, one thing we've learned, especially from this conversation, and you can learn from the book as well, once everyone reads it, is, yeah, there's a lot of things that happen in life. There's When you're trying to go after something that's really your true calling, yeah, it's not going to be the easiest thing. There's going to be a lot of obstacles in your way. You want to prevent as much failure as possible, but failure is going to happen at certain points. And it's not about what happens with that failure. It's about how do you respond to that failure? What happens when you get punched in the mouth? How do you get yourself right. back up? How do you keep going? Do you die or do you grow from that point? That's right. There is so much around it in this book from examples, stories from other people, on top of just the thought process around it. There is so much here for you to sink into. So if you have any aspiration to potentially try and figure out something for maybe for yourself, figure out what your true calling is, find that calling journey, find that North Star point that you want to drive after, this book, Failure Rules, definitely is the one to go with. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to do the whole pitch and just hopefully, you know, maybe you agree with it. We'll see what happens, but I think I did a good job. That's exactly right. That's why I wrote it. No, I really did. I really did write it because I didn't want it to be some self-indulgent autobiographical thing. I wanted to carve out the lessons. I wanted to find some overarching rules, and I wanted to find some relatable but aspirational case studies that were very diverse. Lay them in there, make it very reader-facing, reader-instructive, and, and valuable to the reader that they can actually find things they can apply to their real life and help really motivate, inspire them, and give them practical tools and tips. I mean, that's why I wrote it. And then all the other content that you're doing around as well with YouTube channels, with all the with other interviews, with podcasts, with, you know, talking to me, myself right here, they're just adding so much more to it as well. And you're adding so much more authenticity to the book. You're adding so much more context to the things that are being said. And there's just so much more that's going on here where you can just absolutely see that this is not just all, this is, this is all, this is all killer, no filler. We'll put it that way. No, that's a great way. I mean, that that's what I tried to make it, even though it ended up being 480 pages long. <laughs> I, I sent it to the editors thinking that they were going to have me cut a lot. And instead they came back with prompts for me to add on to it. And it ended up, be, ended up being 20,000 words more than the original submission because they didn't want me to cut anything. They wanted me to add. So I did. I'm glad that they did because it, it lent more structure and texture and everything else. It just is what it is. It's a long book, but I think it's still an easy read, even though it's a long book, because I think it's engaging. And that's what I'm hearing from readers. And that makes me very happy. Oh, yeah, because it's about, you know, as you said, 485 pages. When I was preparing for this, I was pretty much, I went through this, I think, in about four days when I read through the book. And wow. that's like 100, what, 120 some pages every single day. And it didn't feel like it was every single, like 120 pages. And it wasn't just me, you know, reading it, like reading it. All of a sudden I got my computer out here. Okay, now I got to type this yeah. stuff out so that when we talk about this stuff, I've got a note sheet right here to make sure I can reference this stuff so I don't lose it in my brain of all of a sudden. My thought was, what happens if I get a concussion during slaughter to prevail and then have to do this? I don't want to forget anything. <laughs> right, right, right. Last yeah. thing I need is just me going throughout the whole entire thing. <laughs> Not the best way to go about it, but thankfully, that didn't happen. That's right. Thankfully. Thankfully. That's right. Well, Andrew, as we bring this podcast to its conclusion, one thing I always like to do is give my guests, which is you in this instance, a chance to say whatever you want to say, plug whatever you want to plug, promote whatever you want to promote at the end of the podcast. So, my friend, the floor is yours. Sure. So andrewthorpeking.com, no E on the end of the Thorpe is the best place to be routed to all the different pieces of the failure universe, the failure verse. Um, so on there, you'll find a sign up for a free failure rules mini course you can get. You'll be able to link to the merch page for Soul and Fire Supply Company merch, a bunch of killer designs there, uh, echo the ethos of the book, you know, PMA, positive mental attitude, KBO, keep buggering on, never get in, give in, nothing is safe, Wabi Sabi, all kinds of killer designs that our, our themes from the book. You also have a link to the soundtrack, like I mentioned. It's on Spotify and Apple Music, uh, as well as obviously links to buy the book, uh, most importantly. Uh, and the book is available everywhere books are consumed online in all formats. 
So you should have no problem finding it and getting it. Again, it's failure rules. The five rules of failure for entrepreneurs, creatives, and authentics. And there's the book right there. And it looks beautiful. So now it's time for you to this podcast with three very specific things. First things first, when it comes to failure rules and when it comes to everything with Mr. Andrew Thorpe King right here, he just went through everything on where to find him, where to check out everything that he has and where to get the book and where to consume it and all its content, all its glory, everything around there to make sure that, you know, you can understand the five rules of failure and how to maximize them for your own success. And yeah, there's a lot of places you can go for it, but instead of having to do all the hard work yourself and like search all this stuff up, let me do all the legwork for you. And you're just going to have to click on these links because everything's going to be in the description of the podcast for the website, for where you can consume all the content, for where you can get the book. Everything around there is going to be in the description of the podcast. So go check it out. I'll say find Andrew Thorpe King online. Everything will be down there for you. So just go click. Again, I'm doing all the legwork. I'm making it as easy as possible. Come on, convenience is key here. Convenience is key. My economic brain remembers some of this <laughs> stuff from college, I guess. So yeah, it's going to be there. Now time for number two, Andrew. So typically when I've guessed in the podcast, if I enjoy having a podcast, I always tend to make a certain promise as a way to say, one, thank you for being in the podcast. Because again, this is my favorite thing in the world. It gets me so much energy. I want to thank you and a way to continue to support you as well. Typically, because it's with bands, there's always a way around this, but I'm going to have to change this one up just a little bit because normally it's when I get to see a band perform for the first time. Well, I don't think it's really applicable for this one specifically, but it's not an if. This can't be an if. This has to be a when to be, yeah, this is going to happen. We just don't know when. But when I get to meet you for the first time, I know you're drinking tequila right now. So my promise to you is this, my friend, first round's on me. All right. Second round's on me. You got it. I do go to Milwaukee every once in a while, so I'll let you know when I go. Oh, perfect. And uh, yeah, with uh, Milwaukee Metal Fest potentially happening, and if you come up for that, uh, trust me, I will be there. <laughs> and there's a uh, cigar lounge I go there, too. Uh, Shakers, I think it's called. Great oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kick ass. Yeah. Might have to meet you at Shakers then. And first round's Shake on me. Up. Right there. <laughs> Perfect. Now, as we bring this podcast to conclusion, I can't end this by saying goodbye for a couple of reasons. One, I promise you first round's on me. So if we, it, whenever you get a chance to come to Milwaukee, if it's during Milwaukee Metal Fest next year, or just come randomly, just send me a message and say, hey man, meet me at Shakers. Cash in that it. first round and I'll be there. Secondly is because this was such a fun conversation. I enjoyed this immensely. I do not want this to be the only time I ever have you in the podcast. I would love to have you back on in the future to talk whatever else we could talk about, whether it's more stuff about failure rules, whether it's about any other projects you might be working on, would be happy to have you back. So can I end this with a goodbye? Nah. I'm ended by saying, I'll see you later. See you later. Yeah, absolutely. I'll come back on for sure. Thanks, yes. Kevin. It's been a blast. It's Appreciate been a blast, it. Andrew. Thank you. Well, folks, it's been Andrew Thorpe King. Once again, his brand new book, Failure Rules, The Five Rules of Failure for Entrepreneurs, Creatives, and Authentics is available now along with all his other content, everything that Andrew King has done. You go to the description of the podcast. You can find the book. You can find the merch. You can find everything around there. All the links are there. All the labels are there. All you have to do is click on them and go for it right then and there. Fuel that entrepreneurial spirit in you. Fuel that creative and authentic spirit in you by going and doing that for us right now. Go support Andrew because, man, this book this book is awesome. Like This book really, really will get you on the right path in terms of understanding what how, like, how failure can actually rock, why you kind of also want to avoid it at the exact same time as well, but how to roll with the chaos when failure comes or when you're going through that entrepreneurial spirit and when you're trying to build something. On top of that, very tangible and a lot of examples in there well from some of your favorites like Lemmy from Motorhead and Henry Rollins from Black Flag, just to name a few. Also, be sure to follow along with the Corporate Crush Podcast. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok for your viewing pleasure. You can watch all of these episodes right here on YouTube if you're watching YouTube. If not, you can go to YouTube and watch all these episodes. You can listen on Spotify, Podcast, iHeartRadio, Amazon, and many other places that we are on Audio wise for podcasts, thank you, Mr. Noah Britton from Britton Media. I mean, we start out this year at 5,000 audio streams all time, three years into this. And by the end of 2022, we may actually get to 100,000 all time. Yeah, that's massive. Thank you, Noah, for that one. So be sure to go and hit subscribe to where you're listening to the podcast or you're watching the podcast. If you're already subscribed or subscribing right now, a huge thank you to you. Talking to this podcast, how this is like my favorite thing to do and I just get energy from this. That is absolutely true. So. Yeah, thank you for supporting this journey. Thank you for being along for the ride. If you're not following this, you're like, I don't want to follow this podcast or subscribe to it, please reconsider. If not, you're always welcome back another time. Thank you for stopping by. Remember, uh, Manscaped, time to stop free shipping. Use the code CPP at checkout. Link description of the podcast. Thank you, Andrew. 
Thank you. Hope to see Milwaukee soon. Maybe Milwaukee Metal Fest with uh, in 2023. Hopefully. Maybe Jamie Jasta will uh, bring it back. I know he bought it. So maybe he'll, he's going to bring it back. Maybe we'll, you'll uh, show up here. And they can get you that drink at Shakers. Not the first person on the podcast to bring up Shakers. I believe I have to do that with Benny from Avoid. That might actually happen in a couple of days. <gasps> in a world where Kevin is going to hang out with other bands and people in the music industry at Shakers in Milwaukee. That actually might be true. So thank you once again, Andrew, on that. No, nope, that's going to be for me, guys. Thank you for watching this to the Chord Progression Podcast. My name is Kevin, and you guys know how I end every single one of the healthy and hearty. See ya! Yeah.